Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday, July 13th edition of FX Closing Bell. My name is Tyler Yell. I'm a currency analyst and trading instructor here at Daily FX, and uh, this is a time for us to come together and talk about some of the key themes that are driving markets. Um, and, and, you know, especially during the summer months, there are times when it's, it's really a focus on what is the anticipated event and what are the markets to focus on as those events come to pass. Uh, now, over the next 24 hours, the big event is going to be U.S. CPI, uh, especially given Yellen's testimony, uh, which, which we'll talk about a bit uh, here in just a moment. I do need to get some housekeeping out of the way, so if you don't mind, I'm going to go first to our risk disclaimer. Uh, I'll leave that up for a few seconds, uh, followed by our hypothetical trading disclaimer, which basically states that there are no guaranteed profits from your your attendance uh, and there will be no explicit trade advice uh, me telling you exactly where to enter exactly where to exit what the trade size will be um, however I do want to share with you that uh, when registering for this webinar you do get access and, and it's your prerogative whether or not you want to use it uh, to an IG demo account and so uh, you're a, you're welcome you are welcome to that Sorry about that little audio issue there. You're welcome to use that and put into practice some of the things that uh, some of the things that uh, I share with you. So if there's a strategy or a way to apply what you learn from here, um, but you don't want to use it on a live account, that IG demo account is available to you. Uh, also, you're welcome to shoot me an email if you have questions on some of the things that I that I share while we're here. Uh, also, for the many of you that watch the recorded version of this, if you're not able to ask questions. Um, since you're not live, then those are two ways to reach me, Twitter at Forex Yield uh, or email at TL at Daily FX. Uh, and again, for those of you that are new, uh, just to kind of give you a, a, an overview of what we do here, uh, we, we pick apart some of the key stories going on in rates, commodities, and FX, uh, and try, trying to boil it down to, uh, in, my, in my opinion, kind of palpable trade ideas uh, in the FX landscape. Uh, and, and so we'll talk about how some of, the, some of the emerging themes can lead to trading opportunities. And whether or not you take them, that's, that's completely up to you, but I'll share with you what I think are the risks, what I think are the opportunities, uh, and, and, and potentially some of, the, some of the danger that lies ahead uh, on, on different, uh, different, different trades. Uh, so with that, let's go to today's key focus. So in, in terms of FX, there, there really wasn't a, a ton of movement. I, again, uh, we'll I'll talk about uh, a report that came out of the Bank of England today that I think has some implications that's, that's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, but, but really, when you, when you look across the board, uh, one of the key stories seems to be uh, that we're, we're basically getting some profit taking in the euro, uh, that, that, that while the structural view looks bullish, uh, and, and let me just pull up this euro USD chart. Appreciate your patience here while I get this chart going. Uh, but the the idea here that I want to share with you is that uh, quite simply we we are in this environment that seems to be setting up for uh, a bit of a pullback. Whoops, not that. Sorry, you're getting my uh, <laughs> my focus my focus video. Uh, there we go. All right. So uh, this this euro, and I'm actually going to go to a shorter term chart here. This euro picture has been basically consolidating, and yes, we've hit we've hit a recent high. Uh, I'll tell you, in no uncertain terms, uh, my my focus is going to be on the weekly close. Obviously, tomorrow, uh, if we get a close above 1460, that will be the highest close since the first weeks of 2015. Uh, that is that is rather rather significant. And one of the things that I've shared about the oil market, and I think it applies to a lot of markets, is that. A lot of the funds, a lot of the institutions that are holding uh, basically counter trend trades, uh, like a short euro, uh, a long USD, uh, a long oil, long gold, they don't really have the luxury in this environment when the S&P is, is returning almost 17% per annum to hold on to a losing trade if they want to keep AUM. Uh, and, and given given the, the poor performance that a lot of them have seen, uh, the fees on AUM is about the only fee, about the only income they're getting. They're not getting it on the, on the performance side of it. All that being said, uh, I think it's worth keeping an eye that if we get this breakout tomorrow, and, and again, it's summer, so we've got to take into mind that we don't have a lot of the volatility that we traditionally see, uh, but if we can get a close above this top white line, roughly 1460, uh, it would be the highest close, and it could be ushering in a, a breakout. So what is going on this week, and specifically today, uh, that could indicate this? Well, of course, again, we have to, we have tomorrow the CPI data, but today we heard that uh, Draghi will be speaking at Jackson Hole in August. Now, Jackson Hole is the 
Kansas City Fed annual meeting where central bankers from the world over kind of get together, uh, similar to Davos um, in, in Europe, but uh, it's it's a way for the Fed to kind of get together and, and bring minds about monetary policy. Well, Draghi will be sp he'll be attending and speaking there, uh, and it's possible that he could lay the groundwork for for uh, some tapering out of the ECB, and so it's again that's that was announced today. It's speculation. Uh, Jackson Hole happens in August, uh, but it's it's just it's something worth noting that uh, could be just setting up for what I think might be a move up into the high teens for Euro USD, if not higher. Um, the other the other key thing, and I'll go to this chart in just a moment, is the ten year yield. So the TNX is the CBOE's uh, ten year yield product, and it, quite simply. Yields have been moving higher on a global scale. Now, we'll also talk about the yield spread, and I'll explain the significance of that in just a moment, but it, it does look on the chart like the TNX, the 10-year yield could push higher. Why is that significant? Well, it's very highly correlated to, uh, to dollar-yen uh, and, and can have implications for the dollar as well. Sentiment and strong week did not change from yesterday. Uh, most of the action in terms of sentiment remains in, in new initiated short positions in equity indices. And again, when we look at sentiment, we're actually taking a contrarian view. So if there is an increase in retail short positions, uh, then that gives us an indication that we could see a further push higher. Um, and, and, and that's that's what we're looking at here. So that's going to be uh, the CAC 40, the DAX, um, and uh, and the FTSE. Um, and then in strong week, we remain CAD yen. Uh, I'll show you the index for that in just a moment, but uh, I, I continue to focus on uh, continue to focus on dollar cat as as a especially if if uh, inflation misses tomorrow, uh, then we could get a move. We could get a move higher there. Uh, yes, Arjung. Yeah. So a, a a push higher in or a, a, a an increase in retail short positions uh, day over day would indicate that we would, from a contrarian view, favor a, a push higher on those. All right. So let's go to what moved today. So the big movers today and. We'll have some uh, some more details on on both of these markets. So we had Aussie dollar, which pushed up. Aussie dollar pushed up seven tenths of a percent. Uh, it's it's you can see here. It's very similar to Euro USD from a technical perspective for me. This is a weekly chart, so longer term. Uh, but if we can break higher here, and this is a chart I've, I've shown you guys at nauseum, uh, I, I would. I would be aware of that potential, uh, that that potential that we could be seeing a move, uh, whether whether this is a uh, and I, and I mark this as kind of a, a triangle, whether we could be seeing the start of an impulse uh, or what. But we're also seeing this consolidation happening on this uh, near 16-year trend line. So if we get this breakout here, uh, I think we could see an environment that is very similarly encouraging, like we see uh, like we see Euro USD. So uh, one of the things that I'll be sharing with you, if you look at the one-week risk reversal on Aussie USD. Uh, today we had the highest touch in I think four years, yeah, since 2013. So uh, you can see there that we have this environment that uh, option traders are pricing or paying to protect upside on Aussie dollar. Um, on an aggregate scale for what it's worth, uh, on the one month risk reversals, we're seeing the riskies premiums being the highest on Euro pound. That's the highest. I actually wrote an article on that today. Um, Euro dollar and Euro CAD. Uh, good question. Mohammed says, how do you read that uh, that IG net long, net short? Uh, so it's it's retail positioning and, and it's worth noting that you know retail traders tend to be in aggregate in aggregate, not saying anything about any one person, in aggregate tend to be punters. Uh, and in so doing, they're trying to get the most juice for the shortest amount of time on the highest amount of leverage. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, we've analyzed millions and millions of, of, of live trades, so not demo trades, but live trades, and we found that they tend to be undercapitalized and fight markets. Well, they also tend to be unsuccessful. And, and so what we've analyzed and, and what we found is that looking at strong trends where you have the retail crowd fighting those strong trends tends to be a positive signal that the event of trend continuation will will, will, will perspire, that we'll continue to see that trend go. So all, all that being said, that's how we read it. I, I can go into it more at a, at a later time, but uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's something I always keep an eye on. All right, so Aussie dollar, uh, definitely the uh, the performer of the day. Uh, cable also higher. Um, however, I'll, I'll show you again. Cable is is putting sterling against the weakest one of the weakest currencies out there. Um, you've got uh, dollar and yen as the two weakest currencies. Um, I think that we're going to get a short term pound strength, but I think longer term it could get left behind with yen in terms of uh, central banks that aren't that aren't hiking. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk about that in some more detail later. Uh, oil having a, a pretty a pretty promising session. Let me take off this ATR down here. 
Uh, oil having a promising session, but you can see here we are still in a bearish environment. Uh, we, we remain below f multiple forms of resistance. Um, and again, we, we have this environment. Yesterday I talked about the, uh, the OPEC report that their 2018 forecast shows that they're currently positioning too much relative to uh, currently positioning too much relative to um, 2018 implied demand. Uh, also, there was a report out from the IEA today, which basically said, "Listen, we think that it's going to take longer than anticipated for the oil market to rebalance, especially if OPEC." Compliance is dropping, which 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 is happening as well. Uh, gold roughly flat. It actually moved a little bit lower on Yellen's testimony. She said inflation was a two-sided battle, so they're going to continue to hike. Uh, and then and then copper um, copper also falling a bit today. Uh, in terms of fixed income, uh, really the the biggest movers uh, you had the. Uh, uh, the Reichs bonds um, out of Sweden, uh, and then you had uh, CAD yields continue to push higher from uh, from yesterday's Bank of Canada announcement uh, in which I introduced as you know really in, in my opinion the, the first truly hawkish hike uh, out of a out of a major central bank post GFC um, so well, we'll see how that plays out but I'll show you a picture that's basically a gap that gap closing between US and Canadian two-year yields uh, and then equities uh, so it's supposed to, sorry, um, that's supposed to be 1.1 percent is what the ASX was up. So ASX had a pretty pretty impressive performance all around. All right, let's go to the top chart. So that's going to be the TNX. So the TNX, uh, this is a four-hour chart of the U.S. 10-year yield, and again, all eyes, rightfully so, should be on CPI tomorrow uh, because if CPI misses, you're likely going to see that yield come down quite a bit as that punches in. And if that, if 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 the yield miss or if the CPI misses, the yield will likely come down as as investors gobble up this yield while it's available because that could be an indication that we're not going to get the heights that were expected from the Fed. Again, we've had basically three months of slowdown um, out of out of U.S. CPI, uh, and you know, the Fed has come out and said, "Listen, it's trans." transitory guys don't worry it's transitory we get we get four misses in a row again it's going to call into question it's going to call into question a lot of the credibility um, so CPI tomorrow is very important I will tell you though from just a from a pure technical structure from a pure technical structure uh, this looks bullish to me um, oops sorry about that there we are uh, let me pull up the chart so I can play around with it a bit All right, so what we can see here uh, is that off of this long-term trend line, we have gotten a nice bounce, and, and the, the form of the bounce looks impulsive, so it looks like it could push higher. Now, if, if I were to script the world that would likely be a background to this pushing higher, it would be uh, a beat on inflation, the Fed continue to push higher, which, again, Yellen's testimony, she talked about, listen, we because we see two-sided risks, i.e., uh, there's there's risks to keeping rates too low for too long, they're looking to continue continue hiking rates. Uh, and that's why the yield curve has become so important. In fact, uh, Arjong had a question on uh, what's going on with the 210. I'll tell you right now what's actually gotten a bit more focus is the uh, – is the, um, 530. Uh, and I'll actually have a chart. I'll have a chart for you on that. Uh, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, again, we've broken out here out of this bearish channel, which means higher yields, lower prices in the bond. Uh, that seems to favor an environment that would, on its own, signify a stronger dollar. However, it's a relative game. And so, uh, actually, let me show you this chart. I'll just go over to, uh, go over to the bond section. Um, so what, what we're seeing here, and uh, it's specifically this chart, um, what we're seeing here is quite simply a, a more aggressive, a more aggressive move higher in the yield of the Bund. So that's the, the German bond market. Uh, a more aggressive move higher in the Bund, uh, and it's and it's basically leading any moves higher than in the U.S. Treasury. We're seeing similar moves in uh, in Canada, and so from a percentage scale, that seems to be what is driving that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, great question, Nikos, and good to see you, my friend. Thank you for the email. Uh, Nico says, uh, so if CPI misses tomorrow, dollar could be the biggest loser of the day. Absolutely, and that's that's why it's so important to me uh, because if, if we do get a miss on CPI tomorrow, we'd likely see this yield come down. I would anticipate Euro USD closing above that all-important for the week, uh, that all-important 14.58. Uh, I would anticipate uh, Aussie dollar pushing to the top of, of this range. Uh, to me, there's a lot of implications there. Um, and 
and and again, it just in, in no uncertain terms, there is not an understanding, at least at least to the way I see it, there is not a clear understanding if we're in a new secular world in terms of inflation. And, and what I mean by that is quite simply, the inflation readings at which the Fed looks at this this word probably doesn't make much sense, but has not been uh, Amazoned yet. It, and what I mean by that is 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 that we don't have really a, a understandable reading of how inflation should act with technology being everywhere. I mean, technology is to the world as water is to fish. It is just it is just what we swim in, and, and with that, there's more price pressure. There's there's just things that I think is uh, is is difficult for the Fed models to adapt to, given how how much this is increasing. All that being said, I know it's kind of a bit of a tangent, but but uh, it's it's hard to say whether or not the Fed is going to keep the track they're looking at. Again, that terminal rate of 3%, if inflation is just secularly, meaning larger larger than one business cycle, uh, taking lower and lower drops, which it seems to be. So um, I think if CPI does push down, it, it, you're definitely going to see, uh, you're going to see dollar being the biggest loser. Excuse me. All right, let me go back to just some of the key themes here. So again, CPI tomorrow comes, becomes all important. Uh, deceleration for a fourth straight month would challenge the Fed's view that uh, inflation uh, inflation misses are transitory. Uh, again, Canadian bond plunge continues, uh, and then the U.S. 530 steepener. So let me let me pull up that chart, uh, and and basically we had Yellen almost kick off the steepener. Let me let me go to the chart here. So th the steepener here, what this basically shows uh, is that the 30 year started to punch higher. Uh, the 30 year yield, excuse me. So the 30 year yield started to punch higher uh, and the five basically stayed the same. Why did that happen? Well, in, in no uncertain terms, she came out and said, listen, we expect long term yields. So the 30, uh, to push higher as we roll off the balance sheet. She also said, and this is what pulled down or, or held the five, I should say, she also came out and said, uh, listen, we are going to be looking at the yield curve when we determine policy course going forward, meaning that if the balance sheet is in and of itself, that runoff is going to push higher the, the front end of the curve, that likely is going to lift it in somewhat of a parallel manner, meaning that the runoff is going to do some of the tightening for them. That is important because the market was basically pricing in their direct action as something that would be dollar supportive. So kind of unwinding that, what that then is showing us is that if they are saying that the runoff, not necessarily them raising rates, uh, is, is, is going to do the tightening for them, that gives less action that was implied. And that's some of the bit, some of what I have been arguing in terms of how the euro dollar curve and, and some of fixed income is calling the is calling the Fed's bluff. The reference rate, by no imagination, can really hit as high uh, as they say it is when you look at the bond market. Uh, and so that, to me, is why you had Yellen's comments today causing such a tightening of the curve. I mean, that's a pretty significant shift there, uh, and it had to do with those those Yellen comments. So that, to me, is why that's important. And again, I think if we get the CPI miss tomorrow. All the more, all the more, we'll see this. Uh, we'll see this steepening. So I'll go over that tomorrow. And also, just for what it's worth, uh, Friday's closing bell is at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Just for what it's worth, for those of you that, uh, that that intend to attend. All right. So this is the, uh, the, the this is a chart I've been looking at all week long, uh, and and it's just fascinating how tight that gap is closed. And uh, it also helps explain why. Yesterday's rate rise from the Bank of Canada was not expect was not a surprise, uh, not unexpected. Uh, but but it also goes to show that we're getting this follow through on what I, again I'm calling the hawkish hike. It's it's not a phrase I created, but basically it's just an indication that you know the central bank comes out and says not only are we hiking, but we're seeing increasing increasing tightening of financial conditions in the future. So we will continue to hike and, and things of that nature. The uh, the two words that were most, um, or I guess three words that were most significant to me from uh, Stephen Polaz of the Bank of Canada yesterday was he he mentioned a closing output gap. So those are the three words that basically says, listen, uh, accommodation is becoming completely unnecessary from the Bank of Canada, and and so that to me is why we're seeing this. And I mean, as you can imagine, it's almost looking like we could see a path where this inverts. Uh, inverts in the sense of the U.S. yield. If, if if you look at it from this manner, the U.S. yield then becomes below the uh, the, the two-year Canadian yield, uh, and and that's why it seems to set up. Uh, let me pull up the chart. That while we might get um, you know some pauses here and there, we could be working out 
uh, a move to 2460, if not lower. 2460 was the May 2015 low. Uh, and, and hopefully, hopefully, just for what that's worth, uh, that explains why fixed income is important to me. Because looking at things like the US two year and Canadian two year yield, you might not trade these markets, but to me, it's very, very helpful in understanding what's likely to come down the pike for FX. And so this is, uh, this is dollar cat FX. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, let's go over to commodities. So uh, another thing that, that Yellen did, and I, I mentioned this a bit earlier, she mentioned that inflation was two-sided. In essence, we need to keep raising rates. Uh, there are risks to keeping rates too low for too long, um, even if we're not hitting our inflation targets. Uh, she also mentioned that she mentioned that uh, inflation uh, in, inflation expectations, or excuse me, GDP growth expectations at 3% would be very difficult to hit. So it goes to show that there's not a, you know, just a lot of confidence there. 2% still seems to be the um, the, the, the level that they're more comfortable with. All that being said, to me, when I look at the gold chart, that seems to signify that we basically have an environment where um, where the bearish momentum remains. Did I get that right? Yeah. And I'm going to go over to 240. So just looking at this, this is Ichimoku applied. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Ichimoku, no worries takes a little bit of uh, translation to get through. Uh, first time you look at it, it looks like uh, pet pig entrails are thrown on a chart uh, or a four-year-old with a crown drew on, but that blob there is resistance. So that's taken from two midpoints of, of different measures, uh, and it's meant to act as resistance in a downtrend, support in an uptrend. Uh, but as we sit below resistance, the path of least resistance is lower. Uh, and so to me, uh, keep an eye on on that, on that environment uh, where Gold bearish momentum continues, uh, and again, Yellen's comments seem to seem to align with that as well. Uh, in the oil space, so I mentioned the oil chart a little bit earlier, basically pushing into some resistance. Uh, so two two key things that came out in terms of oil today was uh, both from the IEA actually. So uh, the IEA noted that they were less confident on oil rebalancing, i.e., uh, supply coming down to meet demand. Um, and, and especially with OPEC's compliance dropping. So what we mean by that is that there's reports coming out that um, the the compliance with the cuts that OPEC plus some others agreed on uh, fell pretty dramatically in, uh, in in June. Meaning basically they're they're getting tired of it. There was another line that. Uh, basically said, listen, any additional cuts is only going to help Shell. Uh, that's from the for former uh, Qatari minister. Uh, but it, it, it signifies, I think, the sentiment that is that is arising. You know, is is that you know, listen, if we're if we're quote unquote going down, which I'll actually have a chart of uh, energy energy linked junk debt um, compared to just aggregate junk debt yields. Um, if they're going down, we need to get as much as we can while we can. And so, uh, to me, I think it, it paves that path forward. Very, very difficult decisions for these uh, for uh, for these these uh, OPEC members uh, to make. Uh, but again, I think I think not only the reduced compliance of the cut from OPEC, uh, but also their lack of confidence uh, of the rebalancing uh, is 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 pretty significant. Let me show you this chart before I talk a bit about aluminum, uh, but this basically shows so that white line is the Bloomberg Barclays High Yield Index, uh, excuse me, High High Yield Energy Index. So uh, again, just when when you look at um, when you look at this, uh, it's it might be helpful to think that um, you know. So we had energy stocks, that's the blue line, uh, and then you have you have the yield, um, and so a higher yield means a lower price. Junk yields are very high because there is risk readily apparent, uh, but you can see there uh, the yield pushed higher as as the uh, index moved lower, and that's just this chart here is sh showing you that's from mid May. This chart bar from Bloomberg uh, showing you from mid May there's been a positive correlation of falling energy stocks and a higher ha higher energy yield, uh, and then going back here. Uh, Base metals is something we've been focused on. It's also a key driver of, I think, Aussie strength of late. Um, and so we saw the largest jump in aluminum uh, in eight months on a report that a top Chinese producer is going to increase the production putt. So they're basically gonna, gonna cap capacity uh, at a lower level. And that's that's helping the base metals market. So uh, seems to be seems to be pretty helpful there. Uh, 
Chris, I'm not sure if this is what you were you were looking at, and, and I might have covered this before you jumped on. Uh, but the ten-year yield to me is is what I'm focused on. It's actually the chart of the day, um, and and it's going to be incredibly important just given CPI tomorrow. Because you know you look at it from this standpoint, we've basically broken out, very similar to what we did back in September before this very large rally. And other markets are uh, other sovereign yields are moving higher too, and at a steeper pace than the U.S. yield. Um, but again, I think CPI incredibly important. If for whatever reason we can break out and go above 240, uh, it could mean definitely some dollar resurgence. Uh, but again, it's a relative game, so we're going to have to keep an eye on the spread. But uh, tomorrow's CPI, I think, becomes very, very, very important for me. All right, let's go to FX. All right, so from a strong week perspective, uh, nothing's changed here. CAD remains the strongest. Yen remains the weakest. Uh, again, the way that I read this is that basically these are the levels that would have to break to change my view that, you know, so, so dollar yen would have to break below 111.72 to start to say, hey, listen, something's happening with the yen. It's getting a bit more stronger than uh, than anticipated in this current week environment. Uh, and then CAD, dollar CAD, we need to break above 133.50 to say, okay, something something is changing here. We seem to see a stronger uh, dollar or a much weaker CAD than, uh, we were we were understanding, but uh, again, I think dollar is very very weak. I mean, it's sitting near ten year or ten month lows, excuse me. Um, and 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 to me, we've gotten a pullback on euro, but nothing seems to be shifting structurally there. It seems to be more more profit taking. Uh, let's go to some of the FX stories. So. Uh, while we have both retail sales and CPI, I think all eyes will be on CPI tomorrow. Um, this chart here, this is Aussie dollar riskies. So one week risk reversals, again, basically the premium being paid for a one week out of the out of the money option, uh, one week out of the money call, excuse me, for Aussie versus one week out of the money put for Aussie dollar. Uh, and you can see here, uh, hit the highest level of the year, actually the highest intraday level since 2013. Uh, but it's it's again absolutely, in my opinion, worth uh, worth keeping an eye on because I think if Aussie dollar can break out, uh, and, and to me, given some of the data that we're getting out of China, uh, economic data is encouraging let's put it that way um, but that that would let uh, let Aussie benefit uh, a good deal and then uh, one thing I'll share with you in just a moment um, it seems also well po poised excuse me fingers weren't working there uh, seems well poised to me to see uh, to see uh, further gains against Kiwi dollar Kiwi New Zealand had some almost mind-numbingly bad data yesterday. Um, in fact, let me just go back to this uh, theme breakdown. Um, so one of the things one of the things that we saw was that the NZ uh, the REI NZ housing data so for June fell 24.7 percent uh, and, and that that's rather <laughs> that is rather significant uh, and in fact you look at Kiwi dollar which is a chart we looked at earlier in the week uh, and I mean it's 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 coming at a pretty important time if you remember earlier this week we looked at this chart and we said listen we basically had anywhere from a seven and a half to a seven point eight percent rally here, here, and here. Um, and so uh, to me, to me as I look at it, uh, it's it's an environment that says, okay, a weak dollar might might keep it supported, uh, but at the same time, uh, th th there does seem to be a uh, a pretty firm resistance here. Um, so, not not really a trade that I'm that I'm interested in right now. Again, of the two, I think I would like uh, I think I would like Aussie dollar over Kiwi dollar, uh, but some impressively bad data. Now, again, from a technical standpoint, if this does break out, uh, it could mean a larger shift towards favorable commodity currencies, which you know two of my favorite right now are Aussie and CAD commodity uh, commodity exporting countries, and then um, you know quite simply China doing very very well. Uh, again, just from a relative standpoint. Growth, PBOC looking to reinject cash, uh, other things that seem to be showing that uh, demand is going to be increasing for these commodity countries. So, um, very very bad data last night out of New Zealand, uh, but nonetheless, keep an eye on the commodity producers. All right, and then the other one that uh, that caught my attention and actually uh, was the source of a article I wrote, and I'll just drop the link in here for you guys if you are interested. Uh, it's going to go in the chat to all.
All right. So, uh, was the Bank of England second quarter labor survey, uh, which was released. And the reason why this was important to me, and I think definitely one one to uh, one to say, okay, that's um, that's concerning, uh, is when Mark Carney came out uh, at the Mansion House, uh, which was a delayed speech given in June, and, and he basically said, "Listen, for us to uh, for us to hike again, um, we're basically going to need to see uh, wage pressure, which which." We're not. We're not seeing increased wages. We are seeing what almost looks to be the start of stagflation in uh, in England. But um, it basically said, want to see wage wage um, wage inflation. Want to see uh, in, increased business investment, uh, and you know see how we handle the Brexit negotiations. So one of those legs of the tripod of Carney's tripod, if if I can use that phrase, uh, business investments. When you looked at the Bank of England's second quarter business loan survey, uh, it, it showed a rather damning picture, for lack of a better word. Uh, basically showed that there has been a dramatic shrinking of loan requests from businesses in the UK for the purpose of business investments. Um, so th that is a that is a, a key driver of growth. That's going to be a driver of wage inflation. So it almost takes out two legs, if you will. Um, the, the Brexit negotiation outcome is, is a whole different animal. Uh, but that's that, that, to me, is a indication that, and, and I'm sure, I mean, this is a Bank of England report, so Monetary Policy Committee is likely looking at this and saying, okay, that means that the outcome for the Brexit negotiations has to be way, way better, or we have to just be totally shocked by all of a sudden wage inflation coming, uh, as well as, uh, as well as um, either business growth from free cash flow, which which is ha where it'd have to come from if they're not raising equity uh, or or raising uh, uh, or, or raising debt. And the whole purpose of the report is saying, listen, they're not borrowing, they're not raising debt to grow the, the business. So uh, this to me is important. It's it's it didn't get a lot of attention today, but uh, this report was released today. I just put it in the chat uh, in the chat window for you guys to take a look at. It's on page ten if you care, um, but. To me, that is that is just something that stands out and says, okay, if you're not if you're not getting businesses borrowing to invest, um, that 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 speaks volumes, and it likely reduces wage inflation as well as increased business growth. So uh, that to me is that to me is is rather important. So. Uh, if you want, I, I kind of expand on it a bit more in this uh, in this euro pound piece that I shared with you, um, but do with that as you will. All right, let's go to the inflate or the sentiment readings, uh, and it's it's very similar to yesterday. And then we'll take a look at silver, uh, and then we'll close out from there. Um, so in here, and and for what it's worth, uh, the metals the metals number almost seems to be skewed. It's kind of like options and yen. There's almost this skew towards long yen. Uh, in the options market, because if all of a sudden uh, you know war breaks out or something bad really happens, yen strengthens very very fastly on repatriation, uh, and options is just that that kind of tail risk insurance. Um, from a from a uh, sentiment standpoint, we've seen just this almost fixed uh, fixed bias to hold long silver, hold long gold. So just for what that's worth, you don't really see too much of a bias uh, or a or a directional cue in the sentiment. Um, the main thing from here, from the highlight, I would say, you you can see also you've got CAD and Swiss near the top, dollar CAD, dollar Swiss in terms of aggressive bullish positions. Uh, naturally, that, that that has some potential weakness there. Oil similarly, uh, but if you look down here, this is one of my favorite parts of the section is the the daily and weekly percent change in long and short positions. And so you look at the CAC 40, the DAX, uh, you can see the FTSE as well. Uh, but those are those are ones where we've seen week over week a pretty decent increase uh, in short positions. So not a lot of highlight, not a lot of volume there, but it's, it's worth noting that when looking at the picture, uh, it does seem to favor that we could see, oops, not DAX USD. Uh, that we could see a uh, just a continuation of this long-term trend. All right, let's go to silver. So we had that we had that flash crash, fat finger, whatever you want to call it, with silver uh, last week. Uh, I'll tell you, those are. Those could be a harbinger for me, and what I mean by that is those flash crashes. Uh, you know, probably one of the favorite ones is uh, August 2015, dollar yen. Same thing with uh, S&P. 
what that does to me, in, in, in my view, for what it's worth, uh, what those do to me, those, those uh, yeah, there it is, right there. Um, what those do to me is just wipe out liquidity, right? Those those are a liquidity destroyer, or a or you could say it another way. Uh, those are a destroyer of protective of of, of protective positioning. Uh, put in other words, you know that clears out stops, that clears out people that are basically trying to hold up the market or have a position that they're trying to they're trying to hold on to. So uh, when I see something like that with silver, uh, that basically to me comes out and says that you do not have. You do not have the likely support uh, below like you like you once thought you did. So, uh, to me, it's not an environment to get excited about. Uh, not only is it is it falling in a weak dollar environment, which historically is not something we see. Um, real yields are rising. Um, slowly but seem to be rising uh, since inflation pressures are pushing away and the central bank continues to, to, to forecast rate hikes uh, but then also you just you, we're seeming we're seeming to have a increasing discount placed on precious uh, and a premium beginning to be placed on base uh, and, and so to me while silver is more of a base than gold is um, if, if you had a, if you had a pick between the two uh, to me this is a, a pretty discouraging uh, discouraging technical pitcher. Um, you know, I, I try not to bottom pick because because knowing when the reversal is going to happen or if it's going to happen is you know sometimes folly. So I, I hope that helps. But when I look at this, given last week's flash crash, that seems to say, listen, there's likely very very little support uh, below, and that could that to me seems to be the path of least resistance. All right. So with that, guys, I appreciate everybody's time, everybody's questions. Uh, hopefully that uh, hopefully that helps. But with that, uh, I will be on again tomorrow, but at a different time. Fridays I do it at 1 p.m. Eastern. Just to let you guys enjoy your weekend a little bit earlier. Uh, but if you have questions for me, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, and I'll also make sure to load the recording up soon. Have a great day, guys. Take care.